I remember thinking a year afterwards, after that money had grown a little bit, I had the benefit of comparing rental income mm -hmm. to uh, active income through our paychecks. And also, I'd actually seen a really nice gain in the, the brokerage, brokerage account. And I was like, yeah. okay, this is interesting. And that's what people mean by multiple streams of income. You can kind of see, like, all right, I did nothing and got this much. I worked my butt off and got this much. And then you can sort of compare, all right, well, I want more of this and less of that. Welcome to the Rich and Regular Podcast, presented by Success, where we explore life at the intersection of money. I'm Julian. And I'm Kirsten. Today, we're going to give you three solid reasons why you should consider opening a brokerage account. Brokerage accounts. I yes. And I said three, but I feel like I'm going to sneak in a few more. Yeah, I'm looking at these notes there, about eight. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll change the three, title. If you had three a, or more reasons. A three can look like a drink. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. A three, <laughs> a three can look like an eight, depending on how much you've had to drink. Yeah, <laughs> right. It sounds like you might have had something <laughs> this no, evening. Just water. <laughs> and, the, you know, the reason we wanted to talk about this is because whenever we talk to people about investing, they tend to focus on long-term investments and tax-advantaged retirement accounts, accounts like 401ks, 403bs, mm -hmm. traditional and Roth IRAs. And all of those are important, but they're not the only investment accounts you can have. There's another account that's available to everyone and doesn't get nearly as much attention, and it's a brokerage account. So we want to spend some time talking about it today, explaining what it is and why you should consider having one. And it seems like we're like starting this theme of underappreciated financial tools. It's like we're rooting for the underdog. You know, in the last episode, we were talking about 529s. Right. This episode, we're coming, you know, rooting for the brokerage accounts. Yeah, I get it. It's like they uh, they need a boost in self-esteem. They feel yeah. ignored. <laughs> You're a hype man. And so we're like, yeah, you don't forget about these accounts. You know, <laughs> all the other accounts get all the credit. But, um, but it's important because, you know, and we're going to talk about it, obviously, in this episode. But they are, for lack of a better descriptor, um, underappreciated. And I think a lot of that is because people's experience uh, with investing is predominantly through their employers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that sets the tone for their entire experience. But I think another reason for it, specifically when it comes to brokerage accounts, is because of the word brokerage. So at least for me, even now, when I hear brokerage, I think broker and I immediately go into real estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not thinking about the stock market. And so I think a lot of people probably struggle going back and forth and thinking about the two. So let's first start with defining what a brokerage account is or explaining exactly what a brokerage account is. So similar to a savings account, with a brokerage, you can transfer money to and from it. The only difference is once the money is deposited, you then need to pick and choose the types of investments, what you want to do with that money in order to make that money grow. And on the other side of that, if when you're ready to make a withdrawal, you're likely going to need to sell some of what you've invested it in. It could be stocks, bonds, mutual funds, whatever it is. If you want to make a withdrawal, assuming that money is not sitting in cash, you're going to have to sell some of what you own in order to pull, to convert that into cash. And then you have access to your money that way. Yep. So I get the point around the language and the word brokerage, but do you think one of the primary reasons they're underrated is because they're not tax advantaged? I think I think that's part of it. Uh, but going back to what I was saying before, I think that a lot of it has to do with the foundational experience that most people have when they're investing. And so if they are an employee, which the vast majority of people who work are or earn income are, whether it's a 401k or 403b, that's what most people, uh, or that's how most people experience investing. And so whether it's um, the experience of picking funds or even the way that they do, uh, that they sign up for it online, all of those things set the tone for how they think about it. The idea that there's... Uh, the idea that there's, let's say, like an employee or an administrator, somebody that's mm -hmm. there that is the primary point of contact yeah, as opposed to a brokerage, scenes. right, where you are essentially independent. Not always. You can actually open a brokerage and still have a financial advisor, but all of those things have a role in it. The idea that uh, you even refer to having an account as a benefit, mm -hmm. a 401k is considered a benefit and mm -hmm. not necessarily something that you just have and right. have access to and can take control of, or even the idea that the elements and the functionality of a 401k, like the idea of having um, a match mm -hmm. up to a certain percentage or the idea of being invested, all of those things, I think, kind of help 
lead to how most people think about investing. And that's part of the reason why a brokerage account, in addition to the name being kind of confusing, is like something that most people, even if they knew about it, was like, yeah, but there's reason to like not want to do it because right, you don't have no... all of the bells and whistles that <laughs> right. come with a 401k. And so that's part of the reason why we're having this conversation because we want to make sure that people are at least considering it or reconsidering it so that they can think about what the benefits are. Yeah. So just to clarify, you know, when we talk about tax advantage accounts, what we mean is that the contributions to those accounts reduce your taxable income, which means you owe less income tax. In other words, you get to keep more of your earned income. So it makes sense why people are such a big fan of them. And there are actually several tax advantage accounts, HSAs or health savings accounts, which we haven't done a full episode on yet, but we, we will. Yeah. Yeah. Are a great example for those that aren't familiar. HSAs are essentially investment accounts that allow you to take your pre-tax dollars, invest the money and use it specifically for medical purposes. Uh, 529s are another type of tax advantage account. You can check out last week's episode for more details on those. But similarly, you can deduct contributions to your 529 from your taxable income. Tax advantage accounts are great, and they're all the rage among people who talk about money for the obvious reasons that I mentioned earlier. You get to keep more of your money, and most people associate good thoughts to investment accounts that offer you the added benefit of a tax deduction. We're spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> we, we want all the things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of like finding out you got like a complimentary upgrade on your flight or right. like breakfast is included in your exactly. hotel stay. If that was your first experience, that yeah. sets the tone yeah. <laughs> for every other experience you have Every after. hotel you go to needs yeah, to have like, a condom. Fly if I'm not going to get free coupons right. and <laughs> access to the club lounge yeah. and a refund at the end. It's like, well, that's, that's, that's not, not how they all work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, personally, I think retirement funds can be a great tool if you don't have any other options available to you. But if you have any hunch of entrepreneurial uh, interests, or you may be unsure about your career path mm -hmm. and you like to switch things up, you may want to look into opening a brokerage account because it doesn't require you to lock up such a decent amount of your wealth until you're much older. Now, keep in mind that this conversation, like most financial conversation, is going to require some nuance. This is not an either or thing. You can totally do both. And in fact, you should totally contribute to your 401k up to the match if you get one from your employer, because if you don't, that's just leaving money on the table. But after that, you definitely have some options, right? Yeah, I love yeah. that. And you know, I hadn't even thought about that for the purposes of this conversation, but that might be something that I recommend for the people who say things like, yeah, but I have a 401k, shouldn't I just max that out before? The answer is like- Maybe. Maybe, it depends. <laughs> right. Like if, you know, if, if the uh, match is great, that's awesome, right? Mm -hmm. But if you actually don't have access to quality funds through that plan, you might really want to reconsider right. whether or not it's best to put supplemental income or more income into your 401k. I think that's a bit of a stretch, but I can imagine a world where you really just don't have access to quality funds yeah. and you might as well just take the tax hit now and invest in a brokerage account instead. Right. Do you remember when we opened our brokerage? Uh, I can envision where we were. Uh, I remember. <laughs> I don't mean like the day down to the day. I don't know. It's what not we had like our dinner that day. But, um, <laughs> it's not like our wedding anniversary. <laughs> I do remember. Uh, I, I, I actually, I, I probably remember more than I give myself credit for. I do remember it being towards the end of the year. It was definitely December because it was on my list of things to do, and I'd been kicking a can down the road. And I remember finally getting to the end of the year and saying, "You know what? I'm just going to do it. I'm going to open this account." And I'm going to make this investment. It was the first time I'd ever done it. That must have been around 2014, I, I believe. But the original motivation was really just doing the math on what my projective or what my projected income would be in the future. And I remember looking at my annual income and like our anticipated combined income going forward. And I was thinking, all right, we're making decent amount of money. We're not spending all of it. We're already going to max out both of our 401ks and our IRAs. What do we do with the rest? And obviously mm -hmm. we could just spend it, but you know, we wanted to sort of aim for these other goals and we were shooting for financial independence. And so we really needed to put that money to work as opposed yeah. to just uh, burning it. And so that was the original motivation. And to your point about it playing a role in our entrepreneurial journey, I remember feeling that way about a year later, because I think that was the year 
come to think of it, that was the same year that we'd also invested in a rental property. And that might have actually been the reason why I didn't fund the brokerage account up until the end of the year, because so much of the money had gone into the rental. But anyway, I, I remember thinking a year afterwards, after that money had grown a little bit, I had the benefit of comparing rental income mm -hmm. to uh, active income through our paychecks and also I'd actually seen a really nice gain in the, the brokerage, brokerage account. And I was like, yeah. okay, this is interesting. And that's what people mean by multiple streams of income. You can kind of see like, all right, I did nothing and got this much. I worked my butt off and got this much. And then you can sort of compare, all right, well, I want more of this and less of that. Yeah. And so as much as we're talking about the standard advice among financial experts and advisors being, you know, always max out your retirement count, we definitely want to make sure that you know, people understand that there's an alternative perspective, but also that you can take that advice and just do it for a few years and not extend it into forever. I think when people hear that advice, they just assume that they need to do this until they stop working. And the reality is you can do it for a chunk of time and then stop doing it if that's what you want to do. That's ex that's what we did. Yeah. You know, our financial independence plan actually has two retirement funds. So the first is the traditional retirement fund, and we kind of opted to front load that first. So we actually took the standard advice, maxed out our 401ks for about five years when we were traditionally employed. Our contributions were somewhere around eighteen dollars to $19,000 a person. And so now there's this large sum of money that we're just letting sit and compound for 30 plus years until we reach retirement age. Now, the second retirement fund that we have is what's sometimes called a bridge fund, and it's our investment portfolio that consists of cash-producing assets and easily liquidated stocks in a brokerage account. And this is what we'll use to draw an income from between early retirement and traditional retirement. That and business income. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we've got business income, we probably aren't retired. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes. Right now, we live off of business income, but if we ever decide to stop working and retire early what would carry us from early retirement to traditional retirement would be this bridge fund that consists of cash producing assets and our brokerage account. But because of our dual retirement fund plan, <laughs> is that a thing? Dual retirement fund plan. It sounds like a thing. <laughs> if I was traditionally employed, if I was still traditionally employed, I would likely not still be maxing out my 401k. I would have done it for, you know, at this point, seven or eight years, and I'd probably be done. I'd be contributing up to the match, and then the rest of the investments would be funneled into a brokerage so I could have access to money for things like down payments, family planning, all that jazz. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously hypothetical. We're not traditionally employed right now, and while we do still have a self-employed 401k, it's lower on our priority list for investments behind some of the specialty tax advantage accounts like, you know, 529s, HSAs, et cetera, and our post-tax brokerage. Yeah, this, you're making me think of a lot of things now, and I'm probably going to get off track, but there's probably another way that we could do that. So you could, in theory, if you were planning to leave your job, I believe, take some of that money, transfer it into a brokerage account, and then you would have to choose whether or not you could, let's say, roll over your 401k into a pre-tax or a post-tax account. So you could probably yeah. split it if you wanted to do it that way, but I think considering where we were and we had other streams of income, I remember feeling after a while, I was like, all right, the bigger priority actually is the brokerage account. Yeah, the we don't fund. need to continue to put money away for retirement because we have essentially already funded uh, that account. Mm -hmm. So either way, that's a great segue into one of the bigger reasons. Like I said, I think we were already given like five. <laughs> but, <laughs> we haven't even started. <laughs> we haven't even started yet. We've already given a couple of reasons why. But I think this is a little bit of myth busting. And I think one of the biggest reasons why you should consider opening a brokerage account and one of the ways or reasons why they are so fundamentally different from 401ks and 403bs is that there are no limits to the amount that you can contribute to them. And so most people, I would imagine, are like striving just to be able to hit their goals and max out their 401k. If you're one of those people that do that, fantastic, but there is a max amount that you can contribute. And so as of 2021, the maximum you can contribute to an employee-sponsored 401k is $19,500. The max you can contribute to an IRA, an individual retirement account, is $6,000 or $7,000 if you're over 50 years old. They give you a little bit of leeway there to help catch up, assuming you need that extra time. So that's a benefit for those of us that are older. Um, 
Now, every single year or so, at best, you can kind of bank that the IRS announces that they're increasing that limit. In most cases, that's an adjustment for inflation and a little bit of an incentive for more people to save more. But really, in my lifetime, I've really only seen, let's say, $500 or $1,000 increases year over year. In some cases, it's nothing. And then they'll come back and they'll say, all right, we're going to increase that amount to around $500. But assuming you're one of those people who've maxed that out, Same question applies. Where else do you put the rest of the money? And especially if you're willing to do it and you're able, you ask that question. Where else do you put the rest of your money? And I think that's where a brokerage account really comes in handy. For some people, those that are more fortunate, you can afford to automate and max out your 401k. Now, if you've got more money, you don't actually have to spend it. You can still save it. And that's one of the best places where you can park that money and put that money to work. And it's really one of the top, top benefits of a brokerage account. There is no cap limit. And so if you hit 19, 5, 25, 50, it doesn't matter. You can put a million, any amount of money you want into a, bro- into a brokerage account. And the IRS will say, congratulations. Yeah. Not knowing what to do with the excess money, I've realized this is a thing because in the last few weeks, I've had several friends reach out to me because they just kept putting their excess money into savings account and then patting themselves on the back for being good savers, which they are. But if your goal is to retire, whether that's on time or early, you're probably going to need to diversify your assets beyond just cash. Yeah, I was a part of some of those conversations, and I I, I almost felt embarrassed that I didn't realize that that was a challenge that a lot of people have. Again, like the more we do this, the more we talk about money, the more I realize how much most people don't know. So if you're listening to this and you've maxed out your 401k, and you still have money left over, you don't just have to save that money. You can save that money, but you can save that money to invest it. And that's really where a brokerage account comes in. And you can, again, open it up on your own, or you can work with a financial advisor and they can open one up and funnel all those extra funds in there for you. But putting it in a savings account where you're likely going to be earning less than 1% is really not a smart move. Yeah. A Pew Research study found that only about a third of U.S. adults, I think it was 35 percent, said they personally own stocks, bonds, or mutual funds outside of retirement accounts, which means the majority of Americans do not. Two-thirds of Americans don't have any stocks outside of their retirement accounts. Mm -hmm. And that same study cited that upper-income Americans were about five times as likely to own stocks as lower-income Americans. And that's not surprising, but I do wonder if people may be overestimating how much money they need to invest in the market. Hmm. Like for a long time, most brokerages had a minimum investment criteria of something like, you know, $3,000 or $1,000. And that was a deterrent for a lot of folks because it can take a while to save that much. And once you do, finding the courage to put it somewhere where you're not supposed to touch it and you don't have like immediate access through an ATM can be even harder. But with the emergence of financial tech, companies or fintech companies, some of those barriers to entry have been removed. For example, you can buy stocks via Cash App and there's no minimum. You yeah. Just, it's you can so, do a dollar. That's interesting. Now, I do know some people who really love investing via Cash App. That's not what I use that app for. Yeah. So every time I see that option, I like exit the screen <laughs> as quickly as possible because I'm like, this is not why I'm here. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but um, I want to piggyback off of your stat because I found a stat that supports it just to highlight just how few people have a brokerage account. And so to your point about only a third of Americans, is that what you said, mm-hmm. have uh, stocks in a retirement portfolio? No, st- only a third of Americans have stocks outside of retirement. Outside of retirement. Okay. Well, the stat that I found said something to the effect of only 40% of people who own stocks have a brokerage account. Mm. So it's like even fewer people, right? Which kind of makes sense. Again, most people are investing through a traditional retirement account and those who are able and willing or just super driven are typically those that have Um, these additional taxed or non-tax advantaged accounts. Um, Going back to your point about the minimum investment criteria, there's usually still a cost to buying and selling stocks. It's the same whether it's in a brokerage account or really any type of account. There are fees associated with making these purchases, whether you're buying and in some cases buying and selling. And many brokerage firms are actually waiving these fees. They're typically commission fees. But what we're seeing right now, because there's been such interest in investing that a lot of these companies are waiving their commission fees as a way to entice more and more people Mm -hmm. to invest. And these fees are typically charged like pennies on the dollar based on the price of the stock. Now, there are typically other fees too, 
which they'll charge, you know, like percentages or like flat fees, like 45 cents or a few dollars or something like that, based on the type of purchase that you're making. Um, but altogether, it's important to do some research on websites like Kiplinger.com, Investopedia, or NerdWallet. Those are three really great resources. You can also just Google what best brokerage accounts to use or something like that. And those are typically helpful articles because you can see a side-by-side -side comparison. You can see what features or minimum investment criteria or maybe even a breakdown of the fees so that you can say and make a more informed decision. If you are like us and you want to learn even more about fees, uh, definitely check out episode two of our podcast, which is called The Four Letter F Word, um, stood for fees, not food. Uh, it's all about fees and how quickly fees can really erode uh, the growth potential of your investment portfolio. But I think the other sort of development, and I shouldn't say development because it's actually pretty standard now, but when it comes to brokerage accounts, the ability to buy fractional shares is something that has really, really become exciting and a great benefit for people who, let's say, don't have uh, all of the money to cover a minimum investment criteria uh, or don't have all of the money required to buy a share of a particular stock or a particular fund. And the way fractional shares work is basically if a stock or fund that you're looking to buy costs, let's say, $1,000, through a brokerage account that gives you the ability to purchase fractional shares, you can basically purchase a fraction of that share instead of the entire thing. If you don't have a thousand, you only have a hundred, you can buy a tenth of a share. And the next time you get another hundred, you can put another hundred on it. I'm saying that and I'm making it sound like it's a layaway plan <laughs> until you eventually get to being able to afford one share, assuming that one share or price stays the same and you can afford for it over time. Anyway, you get my point. Fractional shares are cool. They give you the ability to get in the game, even if you don't have all the money required to buy a full share of a stock or a mutual fund. Some of the newer trading apps like Robinhood, I'm sure you've heard a lot about them. Uh, they were really leaders in the way of, of giving people the ability to make those. But now a lot of the older sort of traditional brokerage firms like Vanguard, Fidelity, and Charles Watt, they pretty much all offer this. Uh, so it's definitely something that if you're not uh, familiar with, you should definitely check it out. And there are tons and tons of articles about this stuff online. I found another recent stat. I feel like we're full of stats today. But I found a recent stat through a Washington Post article that said that fractional share trades represented about 35% of all stock buys on SoFi wow. with Amazon, Tesla, Apple, Disney, all these big tech stocks sort of being the most popular, which mm -hmm. kind of makes sense because those are the stocks that you've heard they're a expensive. lot about. And they're super expensive, right? Um, but that 35%, that was more than half of the platform's first-time users making fractional shares. So what that tells me is that it's kind of working like this what that tells me is that it's working like all of these efforts whether it's fractional shares or just kind of removing commission fees they are enticing people to get into the investing game to mm -hmm. uh, put their money to work and a lot of these people as that stat and that article reference are first-time users yeah, I think share prices can be intimidating, especially for the companies that people are comfortable with and love. Yeah. And a lot of people just don't know that they can buy a portion of a share. Now, I will say that's probably not the best way to get rich really fast, because at the end of the day, you only own a fraction of a share instead yeah. of a whole share. But to your point, it's a huge benefit for beginner investors, risk averse investors to kind of get their toes wet and like you said, build on to actually eventually owning a share. It's better than cash. Yeah. It's better than what you would earn in right. a savings account. And it's better than nothing. Yeah. So since you talked about some of the newer entrants into fintech, like Robinhood, I will move on to the second reason you should consider opening a brokerage, which is the seamless access to withdraw or deposit your money. Yeah. So for most accounts, you can always check an app or the website to see how they're performing. But if you need to withdraw money from a tax advantage account, you need to process the withdrawal request, maybe fill out a form and work. pay, yeah, pay an early withdrawal fee. There were a few exceptions last year due to COVID, but as of 2021, the government taxes 10% of the withdrawal as a penalty from tax deferred accounts. Now, the penalty is in place to incentivize you not to take your money out early, but it can be a pain if you really need the money. Mm -hmm. And this is where a brokerage account comes in handy because you'll only pay the transaction fees for the sale of the security, which is typically like a flat fee, and then taxes on the gains, which is going to vary. 
Now, for most Americans, the long-term capital gains tax is still less than your income tax. So it's still a deal for most of us. Yeah. Now, on the flip side of that, similar to a retirement account, you can set up like, automatic deposits from your checking account so that you're regularly contributing funds to it. And so some employers that have advanced direct deposit capabilities will actually give you the ability to add the routing numbers and the account numbers so that you can automate and split up your deposits. I remember we had that feature as well. Mm-hmm. I never used it. <laughs> I'd rather d- do it on my own. But yeah, it so gave you us, could do like 10% in your brokerage, yeah. 90% into your checking account. Yeah, and you could do it right there through the employee benefit um, set up, their little yeah. platform. I just didn't trust it. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it is available <laughs> at some companies. We've certainly experienced it's it. It's trustworthy. I mean, you get a routing account and an account number, a routing number and an account number with your brokerage account. So it's trustworthy. I mean, it's two banks communicating to each other. I think in our situation, we weren't always investing consistently. And so there would be some months where our expenses would be higher and we might invest a little less. Or we want to reallocate and go into a different situation and invest somewhere else. And so having it come off the top just was not ideal for where we were. Yeah. But you can trust the technology, I yeah. think. And, and, I I'll, and I'll also say I wouldn't recommend doing this until after you've already taken advantage of your company match and yeah. your traditional retirement funds. And certainly not until you have a fully funded emergency fund. Yes. As much as we're talking about the benefits of brokerage accounts, stocks can go down in value. And so you want to make sure you have a solid foundation with an emergency fund and getting that company match before you start you know, automating money to a, yeah. to a brokerage account. All right. We'll be back with the third reason after this quick break. Okay, so to recap what we've discussed so far, first, brokerage accounts have no contribution limits. You can put as much or as little in there as you want. They're unlike 401ks or 403bs where you have, let's say, an annual contribution limit that might go up by, let's say, $500 or $1,000. With a brokerage account, there's no limit at all to the amount that you can invest in those. Second is that brokerage accounts give you seamless access to withdraw or deposit your money whenever you want. You can move much more quickly and nimbly with a brokerage account, whereas with a 401k or an IRA, it's a little clunky It's for the long term, which is perfectly suited for that. And then last, uh, you can make fractional share purchases through a brokerage account, which is a huge, huge benefit. Uh, again, it gives you the ability to start small, start really, really small, move quickly, and still make progress against your investments. And you might even be able to set up a direct deposit just as you would with a 401k. Did I did I forget anything? Yeah, there's always more. Okay. So the third reason you should consider opening a brokerage account is because brokerage accounts are much quicker for you to access and make changes to. Mm-hmm. So imagine a world where you own a stock or a fund that has a dramatic increase in a single day. If this were in a 401k, there's not much you can do about it until the dust settles. Whereas in a brokerage account, you can pull the trigger to lock in a loss or a gain with the push of a few buttons on your phone. And when the market is as volatile as it has been lately, access like this can add or subtract tens of thousands of dollars to your bottom line. It's much easier and smarter to manage a brokerage account like this than a retirement fund that is usually focused on the long term and really isn't encouraging of a ton of changes day to day. Right. And then the last thing I'll say before we get to our final thoughts is that obviously a great thing about brokerage accounts is that you can self-manage them the way that I just mentioned, you know, clicking buttons, reacting to stocks, moving up and down. But many of them also offer the option of using robo-advisors. And robo-advisors are exactly what they sound like. It's like robots that come up with financial advice based on algorithms that are designed by financial advisors, investment managers, and data scientists. The software automatically manages and optimizes your assets with minimal human interaction. So in that scenario, your robot would (laughs) adjust your, you know, your allocations versus you going in and doing it. I always like to think of them the same way that I think about dishwashers. Like, you know, you can... (laughs) (laughs) Robo-advisors are like dishwashers for the following reason. (laughs) A dishwasher is a robot. It's a machine. (laughs) Which is a robot. (laughs) 
So you know how you can wash dishes by hand and you know that they're gonna get clean because you, you know how to wash your dishes. Or you can load them into the dishwasher and have it, a robot, do it for you. We're not gonna call the dishwasher. The dishwasher is a, definitely a robot. a robot. It is. It is making me think of like the Jetsons. Cause <laughs> anyway, when the robot, robot does it, made. it's not a perfect process. You know, you still need to rinse the plates off sometimes when you get them out. Sometimes the dry part doesn't work, but it saves you time. And for the most part, them dishes are clean. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to let this one go. So you could have referenced the actual, what's that robot? Vacuum oh, the thing Roomba? That we have. Roomba. It even sounds more like a robot. The Roomba. I think we have a, we don't even have a Roomba. We that got an off brand Roomba. I don't like that thing. <laughs> Anyway, I am, all jokes aside, very, very excited about robo-advisors. The growth of robo-advisors is, I think, in part, what really got me excited about jumping into money. Because, you know, I love tech and it was like, oh my gosh, like tech and money are coming together and it just kind of made sense to me. And when you think about over the years, just how much more comfortable, particularly our generation and the younger generation for sure, how comfortable we've become with technology. I don't remember where we were going, but we were taking a road trip somewhere pretty recently. I remember getting in the car and thinking, how did we do this like 15 <laughs> years ago? Yeah, you had to print out map like, People used directions. to give directions. Like, oh, we, even before computers. Yeah, we used to stop at gas stations. Yeah. And they just, they give a long list of directions. We've come a long way, man. Yeah. So like, we're all sort of accepting of the fact that we rely on technology to direct us mm -hmm. like in real time, right? So we know that we can get off an exit to make sure that we're going to save five minutes or 10 minutes or just make a safer uh, route somewhere. Uh, we even use it, you know, on our wrists, you know, yeah. to track our blood pressure or heart rate, heart rate breathing. Our son Sleep has patterns. asthma. And so we use technology to help with that. Right. And so all of these things, I think, are really contributing to why more and more people are becoming more comfortable with the idea of relying on robo-advisors in technology and artificial intelligence instead of, let's say, a human being to monitor our future investments. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is these things can synthesize information way faster than a human brain can, and they don't really get tired. And yeah. so that's really, really cool. That's a plus. And they tend to be a little less expensive. And so all of those things are really enticing. I found a statistic on that CNBC. Another one. You know, I'm full of stats today. Man. But that's what happens when you're talking about investing. And robots. You know, in robots. <laughs> I'm, I'm like fighting not making the robot sound. Oh, Lord. Anyway, uh, I found a stat. And they said that uh, there was a 30% increase in the use of robo-advisors from 2019 to 2020. And oh, I think wow. the combination of that and like fractional shares mm -hmm. and all of these things like are really, really drawing more and more people into conversations about money and investing. And so I find that to be really, really exciting. Now, I can think of a certain set of people that may not be as excited <laughs> about the fact that people are just relying on you robots. Know, robots or algorithms to do that. But I think I'm, I'm going to choose to look on the bright side here, which, you know, takes a lot for me. <laughs> and to say, I think it's overall pretty exciting that more and more people are getting into investing. Yeah, for sure. Um, so final thoughts. I'm going to ask myself my final thoughts. Yeah. Self. <laughs> I just <laughs> Self, what are your final thoughts? What are you thinking? <laughs> and you know, I just, I got excited because I have been thinking about this final thought for a while. Oh, okay. Better be and a good one. And I want to make impulse investing a thing. You would. Yeah. Because we, <laughs> we have impulse everything else, impulse shopping, impulse buying, and those are kind of the same thing. Yeah, but impulse investing say. should be up there. Okay. Like with when you type I'm, in impulse in Google, investing should be a recommended term. Okay. That's my goal. I'm all for it. And I I propose that we do this through brokerage accounts <laughs> because when you have a brokerage account, you'll find that it opens up endless opportunities for you to make quick contributions in a hurry. So just like if you're headed out to a restaurant and the server asks if you would like another bottle, I'm just saying from personal experience, like you don't really think twice about spending another 40 or 50 bucks at the table if you're having a good time. Or if you're shopping for, you know, in the mall and you happen to find the pair of shoes that were sold out online, but here they are in front of you. You don't think twice about 
getting them. And so we ha- we want you to have the same ability to make an impulse investment so that you can improve your future. That's actually a really good point because, um, you know, now that the world is slowly opening up, depending on the corner of the country or the world that yeah. you're in, um, and we're having more and more sort of impromptu conversations about money with people and everyone's kind of weighing in, whether it's GameStop or you know yeah. any other hot topic of conversation, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. A brokerage account is a great place for you to act quickly. If you're having that conversation, you're sitting around the pool mm-hmm. and someone say, oh my gosh, look at my phone, I just made $20,000. If you want a piece of that action, mm-hmm. you can't really do that with a retirement account. Right. That's really what a brokerage account is for. If you want to make an impulse investment, then that money is best suited in a brokerage account. Yeah. I like that. Let's make that a thing. I'm going to play with words myself a little bit and say, you know, when you think about a brokerage account, think of it as an emergency investment fund. Ooh. Right? And so I think we've all been there too. I'm going to go back to the scene that I just set. Maybe you're sitting by the pool or you're hanging at a barbecue or shopping with friends and someone tells you about this really great investment opportunity. You kind of need somewhere to pull that money from, mm-hmm. right? So if you have your money set up in just an emergency fund or just traditional retirement accounts, you don't really want to pull it from there. And you're certainly not sitting on thousands of dollars or extra you know, money sitting in your checking account. I mean, you may, but mm-hmm. in some cases, this is another case where a brokerage account is really helpful. You actually can then say, okay, well, what's the potential ROI on this business opportunity? And you can say, well, because this is how much I'm making on my surplus funds Mm -hmm. in my brokerage account. And so now you've got something that you can compare it to. And if that person convinces you and you say, you know what, that's actually something that I'm willing to invest in, you have the ability to fund that without interrupting any of those other more foundational short-term or long-term accounts. So yeah, I'm all for brokerage accounts. I wish more people had it. My hope is that a year from now, I'm going to read you another stat that says 75% of people, we've seen a huge increase of people opening up brokerage accounts because they listen to the Rich and Regular podcast. (laughs) All right. That's an awesome goal. I love that. Well, Thank you guys for hanging in there. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and a review. Until next time. We'll see you next week.